We'll come back for more from our workshop in the 2021 NICE project. Sarah E., do you want to read the selected passage or did you want me to do that? I would be glad to. I just have to scroll to the correct. <laughs> yeah, be, please read the one from the yellow wallpaper. <laughs> Why, yes, yeah. I would be glad to. And just just for the record, for everybody listening, while Sarah e is scrolling, I will say that every year we pick four books, and then we pick one passage from each book that we call standalone passages, so that you don't have to read the whole book if you don't want to. If you want to just read the passage and have that be your entry or your inspiration for uh, creating new pieces of artwork or music or poetry or whatever. Um, we always like to give our nice audience lots of nice choices. <laughs> Excellent. Keep vamping, Alice. Okay, so, <laughs> so sometimes our passages are a little bit long. Uh, this one's not too long, and given that it comes from such a short story, that's probably a good thing. We wouldn't want to give the whole thing away. <laughs> Oh, well, now I'm running out of vamping, Sarah. You're good. You're okay, <laughs> perfect. Perfect timing. <laughs> I really have discovered something at last. Through watching so much at night, when it changes so, I have finally found out the front pattern does move. And no wonder the woman behind shakes it. Sometimes I think there are a great many women behind and sometimes only one and she crawls around fast and her crawling shakes it all over. Then in the very bright spots, she keeps still. And in the very shady spots, she just takes hold of the bars and shakes them hard. And she is all the time trying to climb through, but nobody could climb through that pattern. It strangles so. I think that is why it has so many heads. They get through and then the pattern strangles them off and turns them upside down and makes their eyes white. Mm, thank you. That was wonderful. I'm going to share a visual of the passage so everybody can see that. Um, now, this I feel like this is a very emotional passage. Um, first of all, my first question is, does anybody feel differently hearing it read aloud than if they just read it silently to themselves? I found myself like getting like chills up and down my spine a little bit as you read that out loud. Well, I definitely want to tell you about how I first read this book. Well, the short story. Um, in eighth grade in drama club, they wanted me to do a monologue. And so the drama teacher chose this as the monologue. And so gave me the short story and I reduced it. In the eighth grade, I did not fully get what was going on. I leaned into that. I think she's insane part. Mm -hmm. And the direction that I was given, and I, and I don't want to fault the teacher because she was an excellent drama coach. I think I misunderstood her. <laughs> but she told me, watch Sunset Boulevard and, <laughs> you know, mimic the eyes of this, you know, fading glory, silent film star who's going insane. Uh. And so I think she meant it just as a body language cue, but mm -hmm. I leaned hard into that direction, which was to really kind of ham it up and do the bright eyes. Yeah. And it's, it's a very different thing when you read this as an adult getting the nuance there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's very true. I feel like this is a very good, the reason I love this passage so much is because it's the moment that she starts to, she's become so obsessed with the pattern and the wallpaper that, um, and the difference between the day and the night version of it, that she, this is when she begins to see the woman trying to get out. And I find that to be quite fascinating. Uh, the answer, Deborah, is yes. I can put it in a copyable format, and I am putting you. it in the chat box. <laughs> okay, it is so also on our website, by the way. Um, I have to say, oh, okay. that, I have to say something about um, the the whole book in general, but especially this passage that uh, you know that idea of madness and feeling like you're kind of going insane, and that, and that something is is 
you know, causing that uh, from the outside, but that outside influence has become internalized. And, and this whole book was uh, kind of difficult for me to read this go around because the last time I read this book, everybody's telling the history of when they read the book. So the last time I read this book was back in the day, probably in the uh, 1980s in a, a college um, literature class. And so that was before my first marriage, which turned out to be very abusive and difficult to get out of. And so reread reading this book now after having gone through that sort of a situation this you know the madness the the you know the 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 some of the descriptive stuff in this book it was kind of like almost causing me to have some PTSD from mm -hmm. some some bad experiences as I I had in my life so um the emotions that you know we get out of the book and out of this passage as a whole I think could be run the gamut you know from the kind of beautiful language that's used the descriptive it's, it's very lyrical almost the way this book is written um and yet at the same time there's this jarring stuff in it you know so what do you think's happening in this passage in terms of you know what's going on in here i mean clearly this is an internal dialogue the, the narrator is having. This is a journal entry, right? So she's really writing like a, a memory of what she experienced the night before. I don't want to talk over anybody, so I'm just going to leave a little hole here. Okay. And then I'll gladly step into it, but I want to leave a hole here. Mm hmm The hole is still present. I will step through. <laughs> um, Take those bars, Sarah. <laughs> I get the feeling that I do when I listen to somebody that I know and trust, like a good friend, talk about a, a ghost experience. Mm -hmm. Where I'm like, I don't really believe it, but you know, I know you, I trust you. Maybe there's something there. <laughs> and so there's like this one level of rational thought, like there's there's no woman here in this wallpaper. Right. And yet there's another part that's like an almost supernatural experience here that yes, yes, there really, there really is something going on. And I, I think it plays beautifully like um um the turn of the screw mm -hmm. does, where you're not really sure is this stuff really happening or is it all in this character's head? Should we be concerned for their mental well-being or for their spiritual well-being? Now I think it's much more clear in this story mm -hmm. that this is going on in the head because of repression. Right. Um, but it is kind of that delightful like creepiness of I'm just not quite sure. Right, right. I think there's there's kind of there's a lot of action in here. There's crawling around fast. There's shaking all over. There's move and, you know, the pattern moves and there's trying to climb through and nobody can climb through and it strangles and the pattern. I mean, there's a lot of words and phrases in here that evoke motion and we're talking about wallpaper. I mean, it's rather a remarkable passage because we're, we're brought to this moment for this narrator, this woman who has, this wallpaper has become a living, breathing thing. You know, it is a three-dimensional moving parts, whatever. It's amazing. Another thing that really sticks out to me is when she talks about in the very bright spots, she keeps still. And in the very shady spots, she just takes hold of the bars and shakes them as hard as she can. And this to me sort of I, and I may be alone in this, I, it may be a reach, but I felt like that was a really good, fr those two phrases are very representative of kind of like the conflict that we see in this book about gender and the power struggle between male and female in the bright light, in the bright spots of the wallpaper, in the bright light of day, in normal life, the woman keeps still, a woman, any woman, she has to learn to keep still because if she isn't, if she doesn't keep still, she might be deemed mad and given a rest cure, right? <laughs> you know, and so, but in the shady spots where she might not be noticed in the wallpaper and in real life, she can shake, shake, she can write, she can paint, she can whatever, you know? I mean, that, that's sort of what I took from that 
that that uh, one sentence or phrasing in that part. Um, and I feel like uh, this whole passage kind of has good uh, visuals and phrases to represent some of the themes and conflicts that uh, we talk about about this book, like gender and power and, and madness and creativity and, and that kind of thing. Did anybody else feel anything like that? <laughs> Did anybody else get anything like that out of the passage? I don't know that well, much. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I don't know how. I don't know how to. Put, you know, I'm still putting all my thoughts together. You, you have this very distinct description of this madness, mm -hmm. and you know, we don't. You know, I don't know. We don't know. It, you know, as you pointed out, Sarah, is this, is this really, you know, is this, you know, her telling us how she's going into insanity? Um, but what I found really interesting and, and I was trying to, and I found myself comparing it to like Edgar Allan Poe mm. and other writers of that time, that Victorian time where, you know, what was, you know, like we, you know, today we have certain things, certain ingredients that have to be there to constitute being horror mm -hmm. or, you know, like right. there's, you know, got to be, you know, screaming or men with chainsaws or you know, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it has, you know, like progressed over the, over, the, over the decades. But back then, back in this era, when this was written in the Edgar Allan Poe's time and this whole thing, they, they relied on the psychological pull in order to make it scary in order to make it impactful. You know, so you know, one of the, when, when I was looking at this, it's like, Oh my God, it's like the telltale heart. I wonder if there's a heart, if she can hear the heart beating <laughs> underneath the, underneath yeah. the wallpaper. Yeah. And, you know, and where the horror comes into play is that in the way that this is described, this could happen to anybody. It could exactly. happen. To me. I've never had PTSD. I didn't go through postpartum depression after my children were born. I don't have that relate. I don't have that knowledge. I don't mm -hmm. have that. So this is a story of someone who does have that. And so in reading this, it's like, I find the horror in that there isn't a, a me and a her you know, her having mm -hmm. this insanity, her having this PTSD, her having this postpartum stuff, you know, we're disparate. Mm -hmm. But then in the way that it's written, it's, it, 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 you know, we, we can become one in the same because of the way that the story moves, you know, yeah. things that she sees, you know, it, the, you know, like when she described, you know, even when you walk past the wallpaper, the wallpaper sticks to your skin. I know. Like, yeah. Isn't that you know, creepy? Had, you That's know, so creepy. Like, okay. But yeah. she, she, drew, she, drew, she drew me in. Yeah. Well, and I want to ask you something. Point, Do you it's think... like, can I become an insane person too? I mean, is it this, uh, not simple, but is it this possible? Possible. Question. And I have a I, question for you. The horror came into play. Because, you know, I don't want to be insane. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> but then, do, you know, I didn't you want, think, you know, I'm sure he didn't want the, the heart beating under the floorboards either, you know. Do you, <laughs> so. do you feel like, do you feel like the first person narration helps you feel that it's possible it could happen to me because it's written in first person. So when you read it, you're using I, I, you know, you're, it's as if your voice is the narrator. Do you see what I mean? Do you think well, that the that's first, at the first reading, the eyes were her eye, you know, it, right. it, it was her as the narrator, it's her story, mm -hmm. her, her thing. But then you're right. It's like, you know, you, the, the, the lines kind of uh, <laughs> seep down the wallpaper kind mm -hmm. of thing and expose the possibility yeah. of this horror, this possible horror that I could be one in the same. Yeah. I just, I just wondered the first person narration as a structural, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as Gilman used that as part of her structural, what's the word yeah. I'm looking for, Sarah E, you know, her. You're talking about the unreliable narrator? Is that what you're referring well, to? Well, I'm just, I just mean it. I feel like it was intentional on her part oh, yeah. to write it in first person so that as people read it, that voice became the voice in their head, you know, the, the personal voice, because you yeah. can't, anything written in first person, it's kind of hard to 
you know, take yourself away from that at some point. I, mm-hmm. I That's how I read first person stuff. Maybe again, I'm putting too much of my own as a reader experience into to that. But um, I, I think what you say is very interesting, Deborah, and it brings up a, a great point or a great question. Was the narrator always mad or was she driven mad? I mean, we don't really know anything about her before the story starts. I mean, mm-hmm. other than she's kind of, you know, grudgingly accepted this rest cure, you know, and then the story progresses mm-hmm. from there. Um, at the beginning of the story, she is very, she, she, there, there's a lot about how she knows her husband, John, is doing what he, you know, taking care of her and doing his best for her and stuff that, that you alluded to earlier, Deborah. And then as she, I don't know how else to say it, becomes more insane and obsessed with the yellow wallpaper. You know, there's less about how wonderful John, her husband, is, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I also found it interesting that all of this is happening in a nursery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> She's mm-hmm. got postpartum depression. So, yeah. you know what? I think that <laughs> was in a nursery. <laughs> exactly. That is. You know, because that, that, you know, that's, you know, where you raise babies. And yeah. And, and given what <laughs> we know. Given what we know about what Mitchell's uh, prescription for her was to take home in real life, when he said, have your child with you all the time, I think that's the symbolism of this room being a former nursery in this house. Join us next time as we continue with our workshop discussion for the 2021 NICE Project.